In our first video on Alvin Plantinga with modality, we learned about his view on possible worlds, that they are abstract objects, they are maximal states of affairs. In this part two, we're going to look at his response and criticisms of David Lewis's view, some responses by Plantinga from Lewis's criticism of his view, and then a transworld identity. Let's get started with transworld identity. Transworld identity means that one object appears in more than one possible worlds. You could also talk about these objects as transworld individuals. And most of the objects we are familiar with are transworld individuals, have transworld identity. So, for example, uh, my pen could have existed in a different world. My pen could have been broken. And that means there's another possible world where my pen is broken. And I'm talking about my pen when I'm doing that. So that pen in this other possible world that's broken, that is my pen, one and the same object. And any object at all that could have been different would exist in many possible worlds. So of course, <clears throat> most of the things we're familiar with are like that. Okay, let's consider Plantinga's objections to the nominalism of David Lewis. First of all, Lewis says that propositions are sets. They are sets of worlds. So for example, consider the proposition, NBA players make more money than those in the WNBA. Okay, so that's a proposition. Every world in which that is true, every, we can call that proposition N, every N-ish world belongs to that set. That's what a proposition is, these sets of N-ish worlds. Well, Plantinga responds in two ways. First of all, he says, propositions are things that can be true or false, but sets are not, right? Sets are not the kinds of things that can be true or false. They just are. They just exist. A second part of this is that we have propositional attitudes towards propositions, of course. We believe propositions. We hope certain propositions become true. We think that certain propositions are false. Well, we don't have those same propositional attitudes towards sets. We don't hope certain sets, what? We, what, what we, it doesn't make any sense. I don't hope pen, you know, it's just something that is. So, and sets can't represent anything. They just are, again, that's not what they do, but propositions can. So propositions are very different from sets. Plantinga argues that means Lewis's view is problematic. Okay, another criticism. Lewis says, according to his view on propositions then, that there's just one necessary truth. Since propositions are sets of worlds, the necessary truth would be the set of all possible worlds. Right? But wait a minute. Plantinga argues that there are many necessary truths, and these are different from one another. So for example, two plus two equals four. Well, that's different from two plus three equals five. And I hope by those two examples, you can see right away that there are infinitely many necessary truths. But just to add some variety, Plantinga's favorite proposition, no prime number is a prime minister. You could say uh, no cow is a triangle. These are necessary truths. Right? But they mean very different things. It's not the same proposition. These things are expressing different propositions. And finally, uh, Lewis says that a property is a set of objects across possible worlds. So consider the property of being handmade. Well, that would be the set that includes all and only handmade objects. Okay, that's what Lewis said. 
Plantinga says, but wait a minute, here's one problem. Some distinct properties are going to have the same set of objects, according to Lewis. So triangularity and trilaterality. Triangularity is not the same as trilaterality. Triangularity has to do with the number of angles. Trilaterality has to do with the number of sides. These are different kinds of properties. So Plantinga's conclusion is you cannot reduce modal concepts like possibility and necessity to non-modal ones like sets. And so that's why Plantinga considers himself a modal realist because he takes modality seriously. He does not reduce it to something else. Okay, let's continue here, though, we'll consider some objections that David Lewis has raised, raises against Plantinga's view. First is the problem of the indiscernibility of identicals. Just a quick review. If X is identical with Y, then X and Y have all properties in common. So if Barack Obama is the 44th president of the United States, then every property that the 44th president of the United States has is a property that Barack Obama has. Okay. Well, consider Socrates. Okay, Socrates in alpha is snub nose, but Socrates in W1, some other world, is non snub nosed. It seems entirely possible that Socrates could have had a different shaped nose. So Socrates in alpha cannot be the same as Socrates in W1. Why? They don't have the same properties. That's Lewis's argument. Now, Plantinga responds, wait a minute, we just have to get our properties straight. Again, if you're using Plantinga's sense of properties, right, this is based on a confusion about those properties. There is Socrates, who has the property being snub-nosed in alpha, and Socrates, the same person, has the property of being non-snub-nosed in W1. Okay, a second objection that David Lewis raises against Alvin Plantinga's view is that there are no criteria of identity that allow one to identify Socrates in other worlds. I mean, what if Socrates had a twin? And uh, what if Socrates had a twin brother that was snub-nosed, and that's in W1, the world where Socrates is not snub-nosed? Well, this gets very confusing. Is it which one is Socrates? How do you know? Well, Plantinga's response is that no empirically manifest properties are required for you to identify the individual. Essences are sufficient, right? Essences are those properties that are the property that is unique to an individual, and no other individual has it, and it has it in every world in which it exists. And so you don't examine proper possible worlds. You don't go look at them and try to figure out which one. You just stipulate which world you're going to be talking about. So I can just stipulate, I'm going to talk about a world in which Socrates has a twin brother. The twin has a snub nose. Socrates does not call that world W1. That's, then we can have a conversation about that world, right? We just have to be careful in identifying the worlds. Okay, some remaining concerns for Plantinga. Uh, this is one that Michael Lux uh, brings up, but he doesn't think it's uh, impossible for Plantinga to respond to. He's very familiar with Plantinga's response, of course. And it goes like this. The actual world is one of many possible worlds. But possible worlds are abstract objects. And these are abstract objects then that necessarily exist. This is kind of a platonic view of possible worlds. Now, roughly that's accurate for a description of Plantinga's view. But this physical universe is contingent, right? It could have been different than it is. It didn't have to exist. It's not necessary. So the actual world is, which, seem to be a possible world that exists necessarily, 
can't be the same as this physical universe. But that doesn't seem to make sense. Okay, the, here's the response. We just need to be clear about our terminology. And if by actual world you are referring to the possible world that actually obtains, then yes, that's abstract and it exists necessarily. But here's a better way of uh, approaching this. We can, we can just put a name on the possible world that is actualized. We can call it alpha. That is the possible world that's actualized. But then we can set aside our use of the phrase actual world for the universe, the concrete universe that exists. Uh, not all of it is concrete, of course, but the universe that exists that we can see and taste and touch parts of it at least. So uh, you can have alpha, the possible world that's actualized, and then you can have the actual world that is physical and contingent. Again, it's not all physical, but it's contingent. It's something that we experience. Okay, finally, a remaining concern uh, for Planiga. Objects or individuals exist in possible worlds, but how? Objects are concrete. So uh, I've talked about my pen, or we've talked about Socrates. These are physical objects, right? But possible worlds are abstract objects. So how can a concrete object exist in an abstract object? Well, here it's a little bit trickier, but uh, David Vanderlaan has explained it to me this way. You use the analogy of like being in a picture, of being in a photo. So somebody might look at a, a really old photo of a high school uh, cross country team and say, is that you? And you might say, yes, that's me in the photo. So even though I am uh, more than six feet tall and the photo is only an eight inch by 10 inch picture, well, how could I be in the photo, right? That doesn't make sense on the one hand, but of course it makes sense that I would be in the photo. So we can express this though, we, can ha we have a language that allows us to talk about this. We can say that any object X exists in W, right? W is the abstract possible world, if and only if, if W had been actual, X would have existed. So the, the language is consistent here to address this concern. Right, so to say that X exists in W is different from saying that X exists, period, right? Simplicity, unrestricted, right? Those are two different things. Um, but that X, when you say that X exists in W is to say that X would have existed had W been actual or actualized. So exists is not the same thing as existing in W. So again, we need to uh, put that uh, clarification on the term and we know what we mean. Now, I think both Planiga's views and Lewis's views are consistent. So if you're somebody like Quine who, who prefers a metaphysical landscape that is more like a desert, then you might have a preference for David Lewis's view. Planiga has the criticisms of Lewis's view, which, of course, since I've been taught by Planiga, I have an affinity towards Planiga's views, and I, these criticisms that were raised and how he responds to, I think, are uh, satisfactory and do the job. 